Year 9 greetings, welcome to Dystopia Lesson 4. Dystopia means bad place and you're studying a novel that uh, takes place in a dystopian society, 1984. Um, what does condemnation mean? You could say George Orwell condemned um, totalitarian governments, if you like. Condemnation means strong criticism. Dickens' condemnation of how the rich treated the poor in his novels is embodied in unpleasant characters such as, think about the novels you studied from Dickens, uh, by Dickens, um, great expectations. You have the character Magwitch going to court. He suffers in court because of certain bias in favor of someone. Um, he also studied a bit of Oliver Twist, I think. So think about how Oliver is um, disadvantaged by one man in particular who's trying to claim his inheritance. So um, finish that sentence on the left. And what's a predicament? Uh, a, a predicament is a problem. And what predicaments might Winston find himself in? Later in 1984, you'll remember that we left him writing a diary saying, down with Big Brother, down with Big Brother. Um, surveillance. We've actually looked at this word briefly before, but it's worth looking at again as new. Um, Surveillance is close observation, especially of a suspected spy or criminal. I can't quite see behind criminal, but I think it just says criminal. Um, so surveillance, CCTV, uh, reporting, secret police, this all comes under the banner of surveillance. And unorthodox, um, we arrive at unorthodox. Well, Greek ortho means right and dox means teaching or path or way. So unorthodox means not the right way, not usual, not traditional, not something you'd accept in common life. So an unorthodox person is somebody unusual, suspicious, someone to be feared, a rebel, if you like. Uh, today, you're going to learn a little about the Hitler Youth and other contextual factors that Orwell used to inspire 1984. So before we talk about the Hitler Youth, let's revise what you studied last lesson. You've been looking at Orwellian governments. What's an Orwellian government? Well, it's one that controls, it's one that uh, embodies state control, really, controlling the public through propaganda. Um, but that's to say hiding the truth with a positive story openly or secretly surveying and scrutinizing the public's actions, spreading disinformation, manipulating the past to suit its own agenda, um, and using political double speak. So the idea that um, I think we looked at freedom is slavery last time. It's the idea, or well, slavery is freedom, war is peace. Uh, it's the idea that the government is saying, justifying going to war because it will lead to a harmony later. It's a way of, it's called double speak. And you looked at fear and tension, tension in how Winston is uncomfortable with his surroundings, has to drink this unpleasant gin to n numb the pain. And um, you also looked at how fear is created by the Ministry of Love, which has machine guns on the walls and um, guards with truncheons. So let's look at some of George Orwell's background. He worked as a policeman, weirdly, after he went to Eton, um, this, uh, the Eton School, he uh, went to work as an imperial policeman and did unpleasant things like shooting elephants and enforcing the colonial laws uh, and he 
always sympathised with the working class, although he went to a what today would be a forty-five thousand pound school. I think let's say the fees cost that much every year. He he won a scholarship, so he didn't have to pay anything to get in really, and but was surrounded by wealth. Felt like an outsider and after school found himself sympathizing with socialists and the working class, in this case, coal miners in Northern England. And later in 1936, he traveled to Spain uh, to report on the Spanish Civil War. And um, he fought as well, actually fought in the front line, although he found it quite boring and, uh, and filthy. Um, he also worked in Paris as a kitchen porter, so no stranger to hard work. Let's talk about the Hitler Youth now. Um, I'm afraid descending even further into into depressing uh, territory. I hope my video summary is allowed. I borrowed somebody's video on the Hitler Youth from YouTube, and it might it might um, there might be a copyright problem. Anyway, apologies if that's an issue. Um, so hit the Hitler Youth were. Um, young people aged between 14 and 18, Hitler established them in 1933 to train male youth in Nazi principles. So what are Nazi principles? Um, well, racism, the idea that some genetic uh, you know, pedigrees are more valuable than others, social Darwinism, sim similarly, Nazis believed that if you looked a certain way, uh, you should your genetic material should be preserved. So Hitler went in for these tall, athletic, blonde uh, children to create a sort of master race, as it's called. Um, they rejected democracy and celebrated their belief in the leader. Hitler uh, was at the top and he had absolute power and, and uh, there was no parliament as such. He, they also believed in the defense by blood and soil of Germany. Blood and soil is represented in their uniforms, uh, brown and red. They also believed in fascism, which is violent, um, violent state control to, of its own people. So basically uh, enforcing the law with violence. Um, the second paragraph says the Hitler Youth carried out surveillance on the public and if you were caught speaking or acting against the Nazi party, you could be punished because the community, community members um, would be turned in by the Hitler Youth. Um, so they acted as spies basically within their own people, among their own people. We've done this, haven't we? So um, key words are soldiers surveillance on the public they reported on each other and gave names to the authorities so they could punish you if you spoke out or if you were unorthodox here are some hitler youth a lot of them are blonde a lot of them are oh well everyone looks very loyal and capable really and um so the future of german soldiering basically it's an apprenticeship scheme scheme in short for rearing German soldiers, obedient, loyal, awesome, fearful, and willing to graduate to become soldiers. Don't they look similar, standing in line and uh, ready for action? So uh, all of these are, these Hitler youth are allegorized in 1984. I'm going to look at them, look at those instances now in chapter two. So let me leap over to Word and just flash through this. I've annotated my copy, but you'll have one uh, as well. So here, here I am. Uh, so we left Winston, didn't we, typing a, or writing a diary, and he says, whoops, I've left it on the table, and what could see my words down with Big Brother. Yes, it's the telly screen. It's an inconceivably, unbelievably stupid thing to have done. Why did I write Big Brother down with Big Brother all over uh, a page? 
which can be seen by my tiny screen. He drew in his breath as a knock at the door, but then he sees actually it isn't the thought police, it's only Mrs. Parsons needing some plumbing issues solved. She has a kitchen sink leak or something. So, uh, and come in because Tom isn't home. Uh, my husband says Mrs. Parsons vaguely. She's 30 years old, but looks older than 30 because everybody's so unhealthy, really, aren't they, on that cheap diet and uh, having drunk cheap gin. Uh, and then Mrs. Parsons talk about the children. Um, there's military music playing from the telly screen. It's the children, says Mrs. Parsons. They haven't been out all... They haven't been out today. It's quite an untidy flat. Um, Parsons, Mr. Parsons was Winston's fellow employee at the Ministry of Truth, uh, a fattish but active man of paralyzing stupidity. He works, he isn't clever enough to work for the propaganda department, so he, he works for the, on the sports committee. Uh, and then let's go back to the plumbing. Have you got a spanner? said Winston, filling with a nut on the angle joint. And, uh, so Winston does this uh, is quite this basic plumbing task. And then, who says this? Up with your hands, yelled a savage voice. Look at how this voice is introduced, animalistic, wild. But look at the angelic features of the, the person who said it. A handsome boy of nine, a handsome, tough-looking boy of nine. This is effectively Orwell's version of the Hitler Youth. His small sister, about two years long and younger, made the same gesture with a fragment of wood. Both of them were dressed in the blue shorts, grey shirts and red, red neckerchiefs, which were the uniform of the spies. So just like the Hitler Youth, our apprentice sol soldiers, these um, little children are apprentice thought police officers, basically. You're a traitor, yelled the boy. You're a thought criminal. You're a raging spy. I'll shoot you. I'll vaporize you. I'll send you to the salt mines. So that rhetoric is just what Big Brother wants to see in a boy, a vigorous boy, full of uh, ambition and, and political loyalty. Suddenly they are both leaping around him, shouting, traitor, traitor, thought criminal. So today I'm going to ask you um, how is this chapter dystopian and how context in general from George Orwell was ref reflected in um, in this chapter. So we've seen the, th we've seen the Hitler youth embodied here. It's dystopian in the sense that his telly screen could read the diary. So there's a lot of surveillance and fear. Uh, it's also dystopian because there is fear of the government. Um, Mrs. Parsons' eyes fit, flitted nervously from Winston to the children and back again. Uh, and that's, let's look at some of the dangers of these children. Another year, two years, and they would be watching her night and day for symptoms of unorthodoxy. Do you remember what unorthodox means? So if she says something that doesn't align with uh, Big Brother's um, beliefs or principles, then her own children will turn her over to Big Brother. It was almost normal for people over 30 to be frightened of their own children with good, with good reason. For hardly a week passed in which the Times didn't carry a paragraph describing how some eavesdropping little sneak, look at the double speak child hero, as they're called, um, denounce its parents to the thought police. So they're so loyal, they're willing to send their own parents for punishment. Um, then how is it dystopian? Well, one another dystopian theme is nuclear disaster. And there's a reference here of the Eurasian army being annihilated suddenly and dramatically, possibly by nuclear bomb. Um, Somewhere far away, a rocket bomb exploded. 20 or 30 of them were falling on London at present. And if you want to look at some doublespeak as well, here's some down there. Ignorance, no, freedom of slavery, yes. War is peace. I think we looked at that earlier. So that's effectively chapter four. Sorry, chapter two. And, and there's some more 
evidence of surveillance, Big Brother's faces on coins, stamps, and on the covers of books. Okay. I'm going to summarize that chapter quickly in about a minute and a half's worth of video summary. If I can find it. Uh, Yes, back to PowerPoint. Have a look at this. It's basically summarizing what we've just read, and I'll see you on the other side. I see that I'd left the diary open on the table, down with Big Brother written all over it, an inconceivably stupid thing to have done. I draw in my breath. A warm wave of relief. Mrs. Parsons, my neighbour, needing help with a blocked kitchen sink. Their flat's bigger than mine, dingy in a different way. Giant poster of Big Brother on the wall. Games equipment on the floor. Spanner, please. A tough looking boy about nine years old pops up with his sister. They call me a traitor and a thought criminal. Nearly all children are turned against enemies of the state. So the Hitler Youth there and how it's dramatized in 1984 in the form of those two children. So to could you make the subheading dystopian elements of chapter two? I'm going to give you four statements I'd need you to copy and complete. So, uh, dystopian elements of chapter two, surveillance. So find an evidence of surveillance in your extract. Government control, find evidence of that. Environmental disaster, nuclear disaster, lots of individualism. For example, I, f I feel as I have filled out the first one for you. Surveillance, for example, Winston fears his diary can be read by the telescreen from across the room. And uh, so complete the rest. And there's more to do. How is Orwell's context reflected in 1984? Um, so I'm going giving you a frame and giving you an example. The example is, uh, so context, this means what was going on in England or the world in Orwell's life and times. When Orwell writes about what uh, the children who scrutinize their parents are symptoms of unorthodoxy, that's my quote, quotation. The phrase shows how the children are monitoring their parents, probably because Big Brother, oops, wants to know. I need to, I need to correct that now. Big Brother wants to know. Uh, Sorry about that. One or two deliberate mistakes to keep myself awake. That's double speak. Um, Big Brother wants to know who's likely to be unsupportive. It reflects, this is your optional context at the end. Uh, this reflects the practice of the Hitler Youth, which would report members. Actually, it isn't op optional today because you need to write about context. 
uh, the Hitler Youth would report members of their community to the authorities. So, so following those lines, please complete this frame. When Orwell writes about what um, you could say the the, the violent boys, the uh, the nuclear nuclear bombs, um, or the the war is peace, um, there are a few options there of, that reflect Orwell's context, Orwell's life and times. So. Two things to do, finish those four sentences from a few seconds ago and write a paragraph on how Orwell's context is reflected in 1984.